So this is a short talk about the role of generative linguistics, which I wish to make at this time. It's kind of, it's not a technical lecture, it's just addressed to a fairly general public. And the reason for making it at this time is as a kind of answer to ongoing criticism that's been recently voiced to generative linguistics, mostly coming from exponents of the neural networks and machine learning community. And well, what is what I mean by generative linguistics is the field that was you know, initiated and developed by you know, Chomsky over you know, a long stretch of time at this point, you know, starting, well, basically starting at the end of the 1940s and mostly you know, the, the 1950s and you know, since then on until the present day with you know, a long series you know, of uh, major uh, milestones and breakthroughs, you know, starting from you know, the period of the 1950s and results related to formal languages, a famous Chomsky hierarchy, and notions of transformational grammars. And you know, the, since the next main step in the development of generative linguistics came then in, with the theory of the uh, principle Principle of like the principles and parameters model, the government and binding in the 1980s, which among other things introduced the idea of syntactic parameters, which you know, provide a way of studying, comparatively studying you know, syntax across different human languages. And you know, the further theoretical, main theoretical development in generative linguistics came in the 90s and Chomsky introduced a min, what he called the minimalist model or, or minimalist program. We sort of moved away from the formal languages setting to a kind of more fundamental and uh, you know, concise formulation of generative grammars. And this further went through various phases of development until you know, which you know, starting with this, uh, the first decade of this century, it started being transformed into the more recent formulation, especially in, now in this last decade, since 2013 until now, you know, a new formulation of uh, the minimalist model, which I'm uh, going to refer to as merge and, and uh, the strong minimalist thesis you know, was developed until the, this very recent text that is uh, being published now, you know, that collects this uh, main formulation of uh, the current picture of uh, generative linguistics. So this is a whole almost well, 75 years of continuous you know, work and, and revolutionary developments in theoretical linguistics. So this is all spectacularly good, uh, history of the of the subject. So what is the current situation? Well, the current situation, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, is that there's been some kind of mounting you know, recent criticism to general, generative linguistics. And this especially coincided with the development of the new, the new technology of large language models. And much of this criticism kind of revolves around the ideas about dismissal of theory and maybe questioning the very essence of the idea that language should be studied as a kind of structure. And well, I won't mention other type of criticism that's not, uh, not worth discussing. Well, of course, you know, by what I just said, you know, no one that's the best person to make Know, a public address like this in response to this criticism, unfortunately, is you know, momentarily unavailable to do it at this time. So, well, you know, I guess you're, you're stuck with me for, for the time being. So you'll have to do with you know, hearing what I have to say about it. So why me? Well, <laughs> well, essentially because, because I happen to be at hand. So during this past year, I spent most of my research time working on 
generative linguistics together with Noam Chomsky and with Robert Berwick on the mathematical structure of the most recent formulation of generative linguistics through emerge and, and the strong minimalism. And so this, this is kind of a long ongoing project. It has already you know, total more than a hundred pages. So it is, it is ongoing and it's probably the starting point of something I hope more, more to come. And so, well, I just I just happen to be, you know, the handy mathematician, you know, in the story, and or you know, I can I can play the mathematical hitman if you want for the occasion today. So, yeah, let's get down, you know, a little bit more into into the matter here. So, well. What is generative linguistics? Just looking at you know, a little more closely at what are what is the main idea behind it. You no, know, as I said, there's a, there's an enormously long story, but I'm just going to focus on on the very fundamental basic ideas of the you know, current formulation that we're looking at. So, you know, to quote the way that Noam describes this in, in his most recent you know, work this year. You know, one can think that uh, generative linguistic is the study of language as a structure of discrete infinity. And the way that one can understand what this means is in terms of the fact that one you know, is looking at a fundamental generative and computational principle that uh, makes, you know, makes it possible for human languages to be so rich and diverse and for the infinite possibility of sentence formation, right? I mean, lexicon is uh, huge, but uh, inevitably finite and you know, in the human state, but the possibility of sentence composition is effectively infinite. And uh, what, but you no, know, it's not, it's infinite, but it's not arbitrary in the sense that there are you no know, very strong constraints and rules on, on how this generative process can function. So, you know, the question is what principles do structure and organize all this linguistic diversity that we see across human languages? How does this process of structure formation and is you know, produced and is recognized by, by our brains and, you know, how this, faculty of languages acquired, how it evolved, and you know how languages change dynamically over time as we know they do. So these are some of the natural questions that you know, we want to study about language. And the, the first observation when I say when I talk about structure, you know, is that the way that you know, fun language is used you know, in terms of speech or, or sign you know, is makes it look like a certain string of words or or, or symbols you no know, depending on, on how you think uh, or how you manifest it however this is this is in a sense a deceiving appearance because the actual shape that language really has is a highly more structured one, which you know I am illustrating here with one of Alexander Calder mobile sculptures, which I think really conveys much better the idea of what a sentence actually looks like. And you know, another peculiar fact of this uh, way of thinking about linguistics, as generative linguistics, is the focus on the aspect of language that is represented by syntax. And the reason for this focus on syntax is the fact that, well, we can think of it this way, like if you think that, that me, well, I'm, I'm kind of a physicist by original know, training of my life. So I like to use metaphors from physics. And so you can think of the fact that language exists at different scales, just as <clears throat> physical reality exists at different scales. and and you know, manifest itself differently at different scales. You know, you're probably familiar with this picture that I put of this power of 10 matter when you, you can go from the very, very large astronomical scales down to the very small microscopic scales and, and reality looks quite different you know, when you keep changing the scale. 
So what is the analog of the scale picture in linguistics? So you, know, you can have the small scale structure of language, which is the one in which the unit of measure is the smallest sounds on you know, the, the phonemes and the, you, know, you have phonology. And you can look at such a larger scale where your basic unit of measure of words, and then you, you have morphology in the way the words are inflected and change. And, and then you have like the large scale structure. I mean, I'm borrowing again, a, a physical terminology, like the large scale structure of space time. That's no, a very, very famous physical text. And, uh, and that's what I mean by syntax. It is, the, it is the property that looks at what language is, is like on a, on, a lar on a scale that's larger than the individual words. And the reason for focusing on syntax is the fact that it is a robust property of language. It's very highly structured. It is crucial for the compositional structure of language, the fact that you know, one can nest sentences and, and, inside other sentences and create more complex structure. And this is itself necessary for our capacity to encode complex meanings into language. So that's, that's the main focus of generosity linguistics. And the next step in, in how one models this is by thinking of the fact that syntax is a computational process. So, you know, computation can mean different things, but you know what uh, what we meant by here is that it's a it's a generative process, a process that generates structures. And this there's a very simple core to this computational process, which is what is called the merge operation. And one can view it graphically by thinking of you know, I mean, these these kind of structures are called hierarchical structures or, or syntactic objects in linguistics. And uh, mathematicians, let me you know, usually more prosaically call them call, call them non planar or abstract binary rooted trees. And you know, you have an operation, a very simple natural operation on these trees that takes two of them, appends them to the same root, and forms a joint one. And uh, so the way you think of this is that the, the modern leaves of this tree are you know, attached to lexical items. And those are the want words, right? And, and these are combined together into these higher hierarchical structures that you know, makes relations between them. Relations that are not given by their mm, Spatial proximity, to speak, you know, in in the in the sense of, of a of a sequence of words. You no, know, it doesn't matter so much which word is next to one, which words are next to one another in the way in the order in which you hear a sentence or write a sentence or well, sign a sentence. But you know, it matters a lot more which word is close to which word inside this higher hierarchical structure, and that's that's the key point in uh, in the way that language actually functions. So the so this is the the key computational process of structure formation. Now you have these three words at the at the bottom. You have like this, these letters of beta and gamma, you should imagine they stand for you know, various lexical items. And the merge is this operation that combines them together, which I'm representing by these blobs in this uh, in the picture. And, and this creates a hierarchy of more and more complex you know, syntactic objects, trees, as you keep applying this uh, formation, the structure formation operation. And I just want to point out that uh, similar kind of computational structures or you know, generative processes are very natural and very play a very important role in the context of fundamental physics. And uh, you know, and this this generative process that I just described in terms of trees is a very basic algebraic structure that's extremely well known to mathematicians, and it's it's known its technical name is a free magma. So. This is there is this this background uh, key structure and and then of course on top of this key structure something else happens which one refers to as externalization. So 
you know, this, this follows this generative process that I just described of structure formation, where sentences are formed as this hierarchical structure, these non planar trees that are like the, the colder mobile that's hanging out there and, and everything is floating around without you know, any, any ordering of the leaves. But then, you know, language is externalized through you know, our sensory motor system, which uses speech or, or sign. And, you know, and this necessarily forces it to be expressed in the form of a temporally ordered sequence of words. And in terms of what happens to this structure that I just described, this means that your, your tree that's floating out there acquires a planar structure. So it's like you put it down on the plane and then necessarily once, once you put it on some, in one way or another on the plane, the, the leaves have acquired a particular order. And, and then you get you know, this idea that your sentence is, is, a, is, a, is an ordered uh, sequence of words. And, and this is where actually you know, the, the way that this is done, the way that this planar structure is acquired has you know, some language dependence uh, properties which depend in fact on this idea of syntactic parameters, you know, for example, different languages have different word order structures. You know, English is had initial Japanese is had final and, and other other properties like that. So here is where you we actually see this syntactic variability, syntactic parameters, and there, there's a whole interesting question, at least interesting to mathematicians like me, about what I what I like to call the geometry of syntax. Like, what are the constraints? on the way the syntactic parameters can function. No, these are not independent variables. There's some interesting relations. There's some geometry, quite interesting to understand that that is going on there. So this is the, if you want, other you know, phase of uh, language realization in this generative model. So let me summarize this very simple picture in very quickly. So language starts, as a formation of hierarchical structure with these free floating, non planarized, no minor root trees, and it encode the structural relation between words. And then the physical constraints involved in externalization, no sound, the way sound and motion work, force a reduction of this structure to an, an order sequence. Now, our brain, you know, in the process of language acquisition, quickly learns from a fairly small collection of such examples, you know, the to acquire the non-directly visible and very complex structure of syntax. So, if you think about this, it in you know, if you're you know, people like me who are you know mathematically trained, say, okay, what is happening here is that you're trying to solve what we call an inverse problem. And you know, you're, you're trying to reconstruct this, this higher structure from, from its projection onto something. And, and this, you know, usually solving these inverse problems are a computationally extremely hard problem. And yet our brain seems to be able to do that very easily. And this is one of the main interesting questions about you know, this approach to linguistics. It's called the poverty of the stimulus. So, well, maybe I should again justify my my presence here in this time. So, why why is mathematics involved? Why why am I here? Well, this is language, right? After all, okay, yes. Uh, but what is mathematics? Mathematics is in a sense, by definition, the study of structures. I know you're going to say, hold, hold on, wait a second, isn't, isn't mathematics about numbers? Well, the answer is no. No, mathematics is not about numbers, contrary to what many people think. The only reason why numbers do matter in mathematics is because numbers have interesting structures. And well, so does language. And so language is also a, a mathematical object of study, just as numbers are. So that's why I'm here. And well, so here's another question that, that actually people have been trying at me quite a lot recently. Is generative linguistics becoming more mathematical? And the answer is no. 
it's not becoming more mathematical. It's always been. The current, yes, I mean, we are, we are now, you know, working on a mathematical formulation of merge, but this mathematical formulation was already fully and completely described in Noam's papers of this last decade. Um, no, it's, well, it's just, it's just there. No, we're just writing it out in using the terminology that mathematicians are more usually familiar with. No, when I use terms like magmas or algebras, modular products, whatever, these are just common currency among mathematicians. It's not the terms that linguists usually use to refer to the same things. So it's, yeah. So no, generative linguistics has always been very mathematical. And, and I personally hope that it will continue to be you know, very mathematical. This is a self-interest you know, wish, obviously. Well, so, but why? I mean, what does one gain from the use of mathematical formalism in generative linguistics? Well, the, the advantage, if you want, is that mathematics is in general a powerful explanatory tool because it has two properties. It's very concise and it's very flexible. And in a sense, that's why you know, it's the language of choice for, for science in general, or well, as Galileo said, it's more, you know, in a more drastic way. It's the language in which the universe is written. And, but one thing that is very important actually is that uh, the, the formulation in mathematical language very often allows you to recognize when certain fundamental structures occur over and over again in different contexts. I have made you know, a, a kind of remark that some of these structures are already, are already known to occur in fundamental physics. Actually, this has been a good guiding principle for the way that we have been writing this formulation because a lot of things actually, you know, they basically describe fundamental you know, structures of nature, fundamental laws of nature. And it's, it's clear that they will occur over and over again in different contexts. And you no, know, one can also think overall that you no, know, what what is the goal of science in the end? It's it's just the goal of providing a concise conceptual explanation of nature of phenomena. And and this explanation has to have certain property, it has to be testable or falsifiable, if you wish. And it has to be predictive and it has to be essential, you know, essential if you want in the, in the Occam Razor kind of way. And so that's what generative linguistics as a whole, as an, as a, an intellectual enterprise is aiming for, is the production of such models you know, that describe the structure and functioning of human languages. Okay, now uh, let's get down to see what is going on actually on the other side of the trenches. Well, see, there have been some excitement about a lot of recent developments going on. And to summarize the type of technological development that we have seen, very impressive technological developments there, they deal with very large corporal texts that are produced by human languages. And uh, they consider certain kind of encoding of semantic relatedness in the form of vectors where you know the things that mean together go together so you no know, vectors you can somehow measure semantic proximity in terms of uh, you know of, uh, how your vectors are you know, angular relations between vectors for example and and there's some some specific computational architectures and here I do really mean computational systems you know uh, Automata, some some form, and in particular, you know, this architectures, transformers architectures, and and especially the attention modules, so called attention modules, that that I want to focus on you know, here in, in this discussion, and and there's some very large amount of parallel computing that is involved in these in these developments. And the result of all of these ingredients that I just listed is the so-called large language models, 
These are machines that produce correct or mostly correct generation of sentences, autonomous generation of sentences and, and language manipulations, which you know, is, a, is a very impressive technological development. If you have tried you know, to use these things, you, know, you would see that, that indeed you know, they, look, they look nice. There's no doubt about that. But so I'm saying that this, this is a, comp a computational system. So let's just look a little bit more closely at what is what is being computed. Okay. So let's say you start with a certain string of words in a in a text, and so words, lexical items, tokens, there's some slight distinction between these things, but let me no, not not get into the details. And to each of them you assign three vectors of like three matrices. We're thinking about this multi -intention. One of them is called queries, one is called keys, and one is called values. These are names, but there's 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 three matrices. Okay. And these encode in, in a statistical sense other words that are sort of structurally related to the given word. And, and here, you know, what, what you just want to mean for the moment by structurally re related is that certain word would be called by or called for certain other words. And this is close to this idea that I was saying of vectors you know, being, being closed you know, as, a, as a measure of that relatedness. And then this, this queries and keys vectors are paired on a vector product. And as a measure of relatedness, so, you know, when you take this operational vector, you're sort of you know, looking at how much they overlap, essentially. And this measure of relatedness you know, is used to generate some probability weights. And these, in turn, are used to average your values. OK, the result of this, this type of calculational operation, or repeated in, on, on this large you know, parallel computing system is that you, know, you train your, your system to complete certain tasks and in particular complete certain missing words and sentences, so word model or add the next word like what happened in GPT. And uh, you know, let me focus on one on like completing missing words because that doesn't require a specific ordering. You know, it requires specific you know, choices of right. Well, an order is fixed, but only in the sense that when you write a vector, you choose an order. Okay, so so let me take a, a little step back here and, and just make you no know, a more a small side remark. So three matrices is not really a lot of deep and fundamental mathematics, right? So so where's the beef here? What is going on here? Okay. All right, let, let, let's let's go over it one more time. Okay. Take two. What what is actually happening here? I'm gonna repeat my story. So there's some very large corpora of text, and this text is produced by human languages. There's some encoding of semantic relatedness, and and you know, I've been talking trying to sell to you the fact that syntax is the, the key to language. But, you know, syntax kind of casts a shadow of itself upon semantics. This is something that is called the syntax semantic interface. And I'm not gonna give you a big plot spoiler on our forthcoming third paper, but that's that's what, what we're focusing on right now. And, so the fact that you know syntax kind of in in a sort of foggy way you know em, embeds itself into semantics is is the key to think about you know what is actually happening here. So you have this computational architecture with this multi-head attention modules. These keys and queries, what are they actually doing? You know. There, there's some kind of statistical proxy for this generative linguistic notion of syntactic relationship, which also you know, can be you know, goes under the name of C command in the in, in some 
formulation of, of, of generative invasive. And, and so it kind of encodes the corresponding positions again not not in terms of adjacency in your in your sentence but in terms of structural relations in a syntactic tree so you don't directly see the syntactic tree but you know it kind of you know these ways this these keys and queries are are searching for this tree and no, so this this so you get to this situation where you have some very large parallel computing that is searching through huge corpora for an image of syntax projected upon semantics. So this is itself a really difficult and imperfect inverse problem to reconstruct syntax from from its shadow cast upon semantics. And so. It, it can be shown, and some, some people have you know, published paper about showing this, that syntactic trees are indeed imperfectly encoded inside the ways of the attention modules, and they can be read from them. So what, what, what is this saying? What, what, am I, what am I trying to say here? So we have this system that works at producing these machines that, that acquire some use of uh, syntax and then some use of language. And one question that I think is a fair question to ask is what about the explanatory power and what about the understanding? If we're talking about science, this are actually the key questions that you ought to be asking. So, you know, does mean does I'm, I'm I'm here to kick asses, so let, let me do that. Um there's been various claims, you know, that these large language models disprove generative linguistics. No, they don't. In fact, that's that's what I was just trying to say. A moment ago, it's it's quite the opposite. You no, know, as you know, this generative process of syntax is so robust that it it emerges, it, it, you know, from these keys and queries and from this probabilistic smear of syntactic relatedness. This do this large language model somehow dispense for the need for theoretical linguistics? Well. Also, no. I mean, one can be happy if, you know, for the success of large language models as you know, language handling machines, as a technological progress for sure. And this, the problem is, this does not seem to provide us with a fundamental, concise, explanatory, conceptual understanding of the nature of language. Well, okay, Let, let's try another question. You know, can these large language models actually be useful for to theoretical linguistics? That I actually believe it can be the case. You know, they can provide a very interesting experimental apparatus to investigate the inverse problem of the syntax semantics interface. And well, you know, one can make some some physics metaphors again. Right? You know, when you, you know, the way you probe some some fundamental theories, you know, in in experiments, you can find yourself in a similar situation where you have a huge amount of data, out of which you can test some some theoretical you know, hypothesis, and, and that's a very useful thing. But you no, know, like a could do it that way, you know, without a theoretical hypothesis to test, you know, you, you know maybe the, the experimental apparatus would be less useful. Well, you know, this this maybe comes down to a more fundamental question that this type of debate is uh well maybe directly formulating or maybe not only implicitly or living behind the scene, but you know whether the fact that you do have a functioning technology 
whether you, know, you still do need science. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my take on that. That you know, if if we renounce the explanatory capacity of theoretical science, that is effectively humanity's self defeat. And I want to end by quoting David Hilbert. You know, in just a century ago, this his famous speech that very much you know, shaped the history of mathematics in the coming century. And you know, he said. We must know, we will know. Thank you.